This is part two of our interview with veteran engineer and producer Ed Stasium. In this episode, Ed talks to John and Stewart about his time in L.A., working with Mick Jagger, Living Color, Motorhead, and the Smithereens, and shares a story about how editing drums saved his life. So these seminal rock bands who were kids starting out, you all ushered each other into the 80s, right? Just happened to be there. So once the 80s hit, like, how do you go about selecting what records you wanted to do, or did you just... I, I mean, was, did you... I was, I was starving, man. You know, I wasn't working right. all that much. Um, I left Power Station, amicably, mind you. We had mixed uh, Rocket to Russia there. That was the first thing. And they were starting to do, like, a lot of jingles. Um, Miko and Star Wars was, you know, Bon Jovi was into that. I'm like, eh, I don't want to touch that shit. And um, there was a band called Riff Raff that uh, the owner of Sun Dragon was one of the guitar players, Ned Lieben. They, he got a band together. They got a deal with Island Records. Bob Margoloff was going to be the producer. And Ned wanted me to be the engineer. And they wanted to lock out Power Station. It's just when they opened stu- the, the A Room. When we mixed Rocket to Russia, the A Room was not finished. We worked at night while the carpenters worked during the day, putting the dome together, putting, building the actual studio. And when I approached Bob Walters about locking out the room, he, he refused to do it. He wanted to book in three, just like at Media Sound. He wanted to do three-hour sessions, no lockouts. Mm-hmm. Um, so I left to do this band Riff Riff. We cut the tracks at Media Sound, did the overdubs at Sun Dragon, and went to Caribou Ranch to mix it, which was a blast. It was, it was middle of winter as well. Wow. wow. Caribou Ranch was fantastic. Uh, uh, Jim Gersio, who owned the joint, was a really nice guy. And there are people hanging out there. Dennis Wilson. I spent the night hanging out with Dennis Wilson, drinking wow. drinking Cavassier. And, you know, wow. just it was his staff was really fantastic. You know, we had there's a big hall where you had your meals. Everybody had their own little cabin. It was a beautiful Neve console, beautiful room. What year was this at? It was late wow. 70, November of 77 is when I left Power Station. And of course, that's when Bruce moved in, you know, right. and then the rock and roll started yeah. to happen there. Yeah. And, um, you know, even uh, Springsteen, uh, Neil Dorsman came on staff. Bob Walters wouldn't lock out the room for Springsteen. And at this time, you know, Springsteen was huge. But just, you know, he uh, come off Born to Run. And uh, I think he also came off Darkness. Darkness. Maybe. Yes, Darkness as well. Uh, darkness with uh, the song Hungry Heart on it that... Um, was it Hungry Heart on Darkness? I don't know. But it, Springsteen wrote that for the Ramones. Did you, you all know that? No. Wow, true no. story. He wrote it for the Ramones, and John Landau said, no, you're keeping it for, your, for yourself. He wrote it wow. for the Ramones. Amazing. A true story. Ed, it's so interesting that um, for all the kids out there listening, that you worked on these seminal records, and you just said that you were starving. And Yeah. I was, you know, at that point, I was on salary at Power Station. Then I left Power Station. And was kind of struggling, you know, I was doing demos. Uh, we did, I did get to do, you know, after that, we did, went on to do End of the Century. And I did, I did Road to Ruin. Mm. And I was getting paid hourly. I was charging Sire Records an hourly rate for doing that. And right. fortunately, the woman that I met, the manager, Susan Planer, asked me, hey, are you, are you getting points on these records that you're doing? And they're, what are you talking about? I had no idea. I didn't right. know that producers could get royalties. I had right. really literally no clue. Wow. And uh, she's hooked me up with an attorney and I, I managed from that point on everything that I worked on, I managed to you know squeeze a point out of, which right. was a, a fantastic thing. But I didn't right. know about that. I was, I was a kid. I, I started starving in 81. That's when I started starving. <laughs> started starving in 81. <laughs> yeah. Started starving in 81, you know, and mind you, I had, uh, by this time I had two kids. Wow. So, you know, I'm, I'm getting by. I'm, I'm never home, mind you. And then the, the summer of 80, just Seymour hooked me up with these bands. I went to Europe. I went into England. I did the Searchers, yeah. the, the, the Liverpool band, uh, co-produced it with Pat Moran at Rockfield. Went out to Rockfield wow. Studios in Wales to do that. It was a blast. Had a great time. And uh, also went to um, Holland and worked with a band called The Spiders. Originally called the Flying Spiders and shortened it up. Made a really cool record. Nothing ever happened with it. It's not even on Spotify. 
but it's a real cool record. Spent a good, you know, five, six weeks in Holland. This is a funny thing. I was doing the Searchers record and I went down to London to see them and th their banner was up and I saw the band and I'm like, yeah, this is this nothing. And it wasn't even them. It was like their opening act. It was the opening, it was the opening act. Yeah, he, he passed on the opening act. <laughs> and, and I finally talked to them and said, that wasn't us. <laughs> but you're our man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was fun. I did a band uh, called another band on. I think it was was it another WEA band called the Babalooies, and then came back in in March March seventeenth, forty years ago. I took you know a suitcase and like a hundred dollars and went to Los Angeles. I said, I'm going to L.A. Susan and I split up and tr started trying to get work out there. And so I, I, I wow. couch surfed. I begged for food. We'd go to a, a Mexican restaurant for happy hour and buy a margarita and eat everything in the, you know, for free. I did. Uh, I became friends with a fellow named Liam Sternberg, who at that time had produced Rachel Sweet. He was writing some songs with her. Um, he got he was working with a, a gal named Vicky Thomas who put a band together called burning Rome. And it was like a sign. He got him signed to A&M another one of the, you know, how many millions of bands have you worked on that nothing ever happened yeah. with? No, we, uh, yeah. yeah we, we still have fun, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I'm saying, you know, 90, 90% of the stuff that I've worked on, nobody's heard of. Yeah. I was telling a kid today on the phone, uh, that I was talking to a, a young engineer in Nashville that, you know, he was asking me like, you know, your favorite records. I was, I, I have a, a bunch of them. There are so many. And, you know, unfortunately you, you just make the best record, you know, that you think is the right record, but then you hand it over. Mm -hmm. And once you hand it over, they, you know, the other people, you know, really make the difference. Yeah. And you become family with these people. Yeah, you become right. family and then you, the disappointment is, it's hard when nothing happens with it, but it is, it's out of our hands. And that was pretty much the only release that I had during that time. Um, your thing was like on fire in New York. I was just, and I was lucky. I was there, you know, I had Bon Jovi by my side. He got turned on to the Ramones and Talking Heads. So, but, but were you convinced that, it, that LA was going to have more for you than? I always loved Los Angeles, you know, from the first time I was there. And I was treated like a king the first time I was there. I went with Tony Camello way back, like in 74, mm. I think, I went to Los Angeles with uh, Tony Camello, he had been contracted by the um, perfume company Fabergé. Okay. Wow. To, they, they were doing movies. They had a production company. They had a record company and a movie company. And this fellow named George Barry was the, the president of Fabergé, took a liking to Camello, took a liking to me. We did two films with them. I don't remember. The one was called Welcome to Arrow Beach. And it was Lawrence Harvey's last film. Wow. And he was being treated for cancer and he was mm. still smoking, hacking. And, you know, we we're doing the um, mixing the sound. They were mixing the sound for it. And Tony wanted me to go with him. And it was great. It was my first introduction. To, they flew us out, you know, flew us out first class. I stayed at the fucking Beverly Hills Hotel. Nice. You know, as a kid, you know, 23, 24 years old. And it was spectacular. And we flew back in the Fabergé's private jet. Drove me around L.A., went out to dinners and went to all these fancy restaurants. And I just had a great time. So I, I had an affinity for Los Angeles. So when you got there, have you, since going in the early 80s, have you moved back to New York at any point? Or oh, did yeah, you... I went back to New York. That's, that's part of the story here. Sure, I did. I went back. Now, the only person that I really knew, I knew like two people in Los Angeles. The, Karen Abramson, who was the, photo the still photographer on Rock and Roll High School, which, you know, I worked on previous to working with Spectre on the uh, end of the century. We did the rock and roll high school thing in late 1978. And I knew Karen Abramson, and she introduced me to a shit ton of people. I also knew this woman named Mary Seisloff, got out there to work in films. She was struggling as well. I, I slept on Mary Seisloff's floor for quite some time. And I met, uh, when I was in England, I met a fellow named Greg Penny, who is Hank Penny's son. Greg Penny, he produced... Um, Katie Lang. When I was in Europe, in the UK, um, Greg Penny's wife, Melanie, was the, uh, the gal at Sire, and Greg was living there. So um, I befriended him. 
And, you know, he went on to do the KD Lang records, especially the first one. And um, uh, Gary Gunton and Dave Jordan, I met Dave at a party, Dave Jordan, at a party that I went to, the Talking Heads had played in town, and I went with Jerry Harrison to a party, and I met Dave there. And Dave was working on Jerry Harrison's solo record at the time. Wow. 81. And uh, they had a place called El Dorado. It was, it was um, right where the palace is. That's all I knew you know, mm-hmm. you know, so I went and I worked with Giorgio Moroder for a, a couple projects. He was doing he was doing a soundtrack to the uh, the, the film Metropolis about the robot. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was yeah. A, it was a silent film, I believe, but he was doing a soundtrack to it. And I worked on that. And at one point in late 1983, um, I get a call from Gary Gunton. Uh, you know, Dave was becoming quite popular as an engineer at this time. 83 and Pete Wolf had just left the Jay Giles band, got a hold of Gary or Dave and wanted him to work on his solo record. And Dave couldn't do it. He was assigned to do something else. And they recommended me. Pete calls me up. Come on out to Boston for the weekend. Let's let's meet. Let's talk. Uh, Flies me out. I flew out to Boston and I got hired on the Pete Wolf gig. Great. Great. As an engineer. What a great artist. Yeah, yeah what a great singer. Yeah, I, I, and I love and, Jay Giles, you know? And yeah. Pete and I got along really well. But he's just a real blues. Like, he knows his... Oh, he... I mean, yeah. what a soul, yeah. And he has the greatest record collection. Right, you know, I bet. Oh, really? Walls of vinyl. Yeah, he's a real... He's a true aficionado of vinyl. Yeah. 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 You did it in Boston? We did it in Boston. We did it at the car studio. That's Synchro Sound. Nice. And that's when I met all the guys in the cars. You know, they would hang out. They had a clubhouse there. There was a lounge in the basement. And all the guys would come down. Uh, all sorts of people could come through. Carly Simon would come through. That's when I met Danny Goldberg. Joe Perry would come down. Mm. And, you know, Elliot Easton. That's when I met Elliot, who, you know, Great. I, you know, now is in the Empty Hearts. And, you know, who I've done two records with recently Great. over the last six, seven years. Elliot's a great guy. Great guitar player. He played. A lot of great guitar players. Yeah, yeah. So good. So melodic. Oh, man. Uh, nothing like him. He's the best. He really is. Is he underrated? I can't tell. Or like, he's totally uh, underrated, man. Yeah, okay, I thought yeah. so. Yeah, because I, I, I agree he's a great guitar player, but I don't really hear about him enough when you hear about the cars and stuff. You know what I mean? Listen to those solos that he plays on. Yeah. And, and oh, my he, God. so memorable. Yeah, they're, 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 they're just as good as like the melody of the song. That's right. And they're so right. specific and so good. That's right. Did he play left-handed? Yes, he's a lefty. And like upside down, maybe even. No, no, he didn't play upside no, down. He, okay, they, they wound proper, proper right. left hand guitars. Right. Yeah, great, great guy. Anyway, so we go to I go to Boston. Uh, Francine comes with me. She tags along. I uh, Pete, it was cool with Pete, and we uh, stayed there. Got there in November, and we stayed in Boston until March. And you know, this was I negotiated a great daily rate which I had never gotten before. All of a sudden I was making decent money. It was fantastic. I was able to buy my mom and my stepdad a nice stereo for that Christmas, Christmas, uh, yeah. Christmas of 83 going into 84. During the time we were working uh, on Pete's record, the cars were working with Mutt Lang on Heartbeat City. Mm-hmm. They had done the tracks, you know, and uh, I mean, you know, Mutt works forever on this stuff, apparently. Yeah. I mean, you've heard the reputation, I'm sure. Yeah. So Rick pops in the control room one day and says, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. I'm going to the England. Must, we're going to mix the record. I'm going to go. I'm going to hang out. Okay. So, you know, just think nothing. I would see you, Rick. Have fun. Yeah. I hope, you know, hope it all works out and just keep working. We, it was great. You know, working with Pete was so much fun. It was always joy in the room. And jams, there was all we called the uh, TikTok lounge. We'd all go out into the room. We had a PA set up. You know, people would sit down and play. And I'd play drums or guitar or bass. And uh, right. my, Michael Johnson uh, would also, he was the producer, uh, a hip hop kind of guy. He was really a, a cool dude. Um, Who was the band? Um, boy, we used drum machines a lot. Right. And when we did put drums on, we used Yogi Horton. Right. We got, we sure. got, I got Yogi Horton in somehow, mm-hmm. and we got Adrian Ballou came in and did some stuff. Nice. 
But by the way, Adrian Ballou, very un Jay Giles band like. Yes, very un Jay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the stuff he plays on that solo record is 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 crazy. Unfortunately, that record is not on on the streaming services for some yeah. reason. Because there, there's a song called Billy Big Time that Ballou plays some incredible shit. Like all the sustaining fucking Ebo out of this world fucking space shit. It's fantastic, right. fantastic stuff. What a talent. He blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we continue to work. You know, mind you, this I got there in November, working through Christmas. I was able to spend Christmas at my mom's house in Jersey uh, with my, you know, my kids and everything. It was great. Working through to March, you know, have nice dinners, do this and um, pretty much finishing up the record. And Pete takes me out to dinner and he wanted a, a certain um, great person to mix the record. But he asked me at dinner, I'd like you to mix the record. You think we could pull it off? And I'm there. Yeah, of course I can. I want to go to New York to mix the record. Okay. You know, I've been out of New York for four years at this point and made some calls and somehow Francine helped with the booking and got, got, um, found out about right track studios where I had actually done in the original right track. I had done demos with, um, Daniel Ray's band, Shrapnel. I mixed some songs for them there. At the I remember end. Daniel Ray. Yeah, yeah. He did some, yeah. a bunch of Ramon stuff. And he was right. in a band called Shrapnel. And I had mixed with Legs McNeil was the producer um, wow. on these Shrapnel records. And I worked at the original right track. And Simon Andrews was the owner, uh, who I knew from b- back then, barely. Uh, Mark Harvey, the great Mark Harvey, the late great Mark Harvey, was the manager of right track at the time. And we booked right track. And we went down there and uh, stayed at the the Mayflower. When the Mayflower was, it was a great hotel. You know, there, there was all pretty much all suites. It was funky. It was old. You know, it was mm-hmm. built in like the 30s or 40s. And but it was great. You know, the elevator operators, they all know your name. You know, it was it was inexpensive at the time. You know, it was it was right on Central Park. I mean, my daughter would come in and hang out. My son. It was a uh, it was a good time. It was really fantastic. We must have worked on the record for four or five months. You know, all sorts of people came by. You know, Jagger came by uh, to sing on one of the songs. And we were jamming. I have a tape of us somewhere doing like stuff with like Mona and uh, uh-huh. Ain't Too Proud to Beg. I'm playing drums on these things. And Jagger singing. We were just jamming out there. It was a lot of fun. You know, fucking jamming with Mick Jagger. What the fuck? In the studio in, New, right. in New York. It was great. You know, Dylan came by. Did I mention that? Wow. Did I mention no. Bob Dylan came by? Wow. I'm no. Like, I'm like this. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, and uh, Bob, how did it feel? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. He he said something to the fact that that's a really nice groove you got going on with that echo on that delay there. I was uh, I remember on one of the songs I was another copying one of Bobby Clear Mountain's things on Let's Dance, where the back and forth echo thing on a cowbell. I was doing something like that on the Wolf record. You know, I always copy ideas from exactly. influ- influences. And he commented on that. So that that was cool. And we ended up being there like forever. And, you know, I was running into people in in Manhattan, in New York, at the studio. I popped into Media Sound, saw people. And people are all saying, what are you doing in L.A.? What the fuck are you doing in L.A., man? You should come come back to New York. This is where you belong. Come back to New York. I'm there. Okay. And I remember having a lunch with uh, Francine, sitting at some cafe on the Upper West Side by the Mayflower. And we decided that we we're going to bust out of LA and, and move to New York. And sure enough, that's what we did. And it was, I was a little nervous about it, you know, cause you don't know where the next buck is coming from. Right. And, you know, at the time, 15, $1,600 a month for an apartment was a lot of money yeah. you know, in 1984. Right. And uh, we got a beautiful apartment on West 78th street, floor through a uh, really nice a little balcony on the back overlooking the courtyards. Um, it was a, you know, one bedroom, but really nice, you know, fireplace and living room, uh, walk up to the kitchen and dining room area. It was, it was, it was a brownstone and, um, gosh, where do I go from here? I'm in New York. Was there more yeah. Ramones? Yes, there was. I, I remember staying at the Mayflower and, um, getting a call from Gary Kerfurst, who was managing Talking Heads, Ramones and Eurythmus at the time. And, uh, they wanted Tommy and I to reunite as producers and work on what was going to be uh, Too Tough to Die, which we cut at Media Sound. And Dave Stewart was involved uh, with one yeah. of the songs, Howling at the Moon. 
um, we actually used a, a kind of a click track. It was a, but it was a sound effect that Dave had found somewhere. It was like <laughs> some wacky thing that we played along with 84, 85, uh, you know, get a call from David Anderley, um, do, do a band called Swimming Pool Cues. They recorded that in Atlanta. And they, they were a great band. There's some really, really talented, you know, not, nothing ever happened with them, but it was a great record. A band called Face to Face from Boston that I did. They were great. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, worked with them. And that was a female singer, right? Yes. She yes. had a great, I remember really liking them. They, yeah. two, they had two or three records out. They did pretty good in the at one point. They yeah, were making they, some noise. They, yeah. Jimmy Iovine and Ch Shelly Yakis did their first record and they had, they had kind of a hit. I co-produced the um, face to face record with Arthur Baker. Nice. And we did it at right track power station and electric lady. Oh, the long riders, the great long oh, wow. riders. Uh, oh, yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who I did a record with, uh, you know, a recent one, three years, you know, three years ago. Was yeah. And new record. Stephen McCarthy. Yeah, he um, he played on a Dream Syndicate record that I worked, I produced. You told me that I mean, a few years ago. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, he's great. He yeah. came in for a jam night, and like you were talking about the jams, they mm -hmm. jammed for four straight hours. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, um, he's uh, great. Tom, the bass player, recently passed away. Yeah, so yeah. We're, we're working on uh, a long writer song uh, that uh, the drummer came up with uh, lyrics in a dream and wrote the lyrics wow. down. Handed them off to Steve. Steve came up with a song, and we're working on that song now. Um, you know, Greg's in L.A. I'm here in, in fabulous Poway in San Diego County. Um, you know, uh, Stephen's right by you over there in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. He's in Richmond, though, isn't he? I'm sorry, yeah. He's in Richmond, yep. Virginia. And Sid's in, Sid Griffin's in London. So it's a um, truly wide world collaboration here. Yeah, so I did the Long Riders and went out to uh, – that was the first time I worked at A&M Studios. Wow. That was it's when uh, – Shelly Yakis and Jimmy Iovine took over the building Beautiful. and kind of did a lot of redesigning to the studios. Um, the great Mark Harvey was now the manager. He had been managing the right track in New York and Herb picked up on his vibe and uh, Herb, uh, Herb Alper uh, hired him to run the studio uh, when Jimmy and uh, Shelly were there. Mark was a reason later on that I moved back to LA um, hmm. in 89 but that's another story. That's a con con continuing story of this fellow here, oh. me, yeah, whatever. Uh, the road uh, Ed traveled. Ed traveled, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so there's a shitload of projects in there that I'm not even mentioning. I don't even remember. But um, ultimately, the big opportunity, let's say, was again handed to me by Dave Jordan. I'm living in Manhattan, doing projects, doing doing okay, hanging in there. Um, got the nice apartment on 78th Street. And I had seen Dave when I was, I was working on something at Right Track, and um, the Stones, the Stones were at Right Track working on dirty work. Uh, Steve Lillywhite was producing, and um, they had recorded most of it in Paris, but they're fi finalizing some stuff at Right Track in New York City. And uh, Dave Jordan was the engineer working with Lillywhite. And we were hanging out a bit, you know. Um, I saw Mick, who I had met during the Peter Wolf record. So you see him in a hallway. We played video games and shit. And um, at one point, I um, I met with Keith when I was in London. I guess, when was that? I think it was around 86, 87, around there that same time. Um, he was doing, uh, working with Aretha on the Jumping Jack Flash movie. We we're going to do a song. And I, I kind of hung out with him in his uh, penthouse of the St. James Club. Bobby Keys was there. They were all doing powder and drinking beer and shots and shit. It was like, hey, this is fun, hanging out with Keith. Anyway, so Mick is on to doing his new solo record. He's in Barbados. And he wanted Dave Jordan to come down and work on vocals and do some guitar overdubs with Jeff Beck. Dave couldn't do it. This is when Dave was getting really hot. Alice in Chains. Alice in Chains, was that? Yeah, Man in a Box. Yeah, and Jane's Addiction as well, I think around the same time. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, I get the call and say, hey, you wanna, wanna go to Barbados and work with Mick Jagger on vocals on there? Nah, not me, I don't wanna do that, fuck that. No, it was like, <laughs> of course I do, what are you kidding me? And says, okay, I'll have Mick call you. So I was living in New York and you know, Jagger gives me a call. He, I had met him a couple times and we got on okay. And uh, he says, yeah, he was down in Barbados already. He was hanging out at Eddie Grant's studio called Blue Wave. Hmm. A small little place, a residential studio. And uh, he says, go to Manny's. Um, 
Jeff forgot his rat box, he, the rat, you know, the mm -hmm. stomp box, and pick up a rat and any other box that you might think is. So I went and I still have that rat box that I got specifically nice. for the purpose of, you know, Jeff Beck. And Jeff Beck, I fucking love Jeff Beck. I think, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not a Clapton yeah. fan, I'm a big page fan, but, you know, Beck, those first two solo records just knocked me out. And, you know. Oh, it's like blow by blow, right? No, his solo records. Like oh, the Jeff Beck group. Yeah, Jeff Beck group. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Truth, right. Truth, yep. yeah. and um, Beck Ola. Beck Ola. Beck Ola. Yeah, yeah, just great. Yeah. I loved those records especially. And so I'm the, and he said, yeah, can you come down? Can you come down tomorrow? I'm uh, sure. Okay, we'll get you tickets. Um, can Francine come? Sure. Give her tickets. <laughs> Boom. So here we go. We're off to uh, work with Mick supposedly for two weeks doing vocals fly down there. Arnold Dunn was mixed guy at the time, picked us up at the airport and get to the studio. You know, here's the, they're, they're all, they're hanging out at dinner. Just, it was a residential studio, the kitchen. We each had our individual little apartment, really nice. And we start working and the, the tapes are an absolute mess. They were mm. recorded all over the place. They're different. Dave Stewart produced some stuff. Keith Diamond did some stuff and Mick did some stuff. Some stuff was from Hilversum, a studio in Hilversum, Holland. Some other stuff was from, I don't even know where it was, in uh, London. There was a studio in London. I don't remember which studio it was. And then they had recorded stuff in New York. So there's three different sets of tones for all these sessions. Nothing is consolidated. The tapes are a mess. So I, I literally had a take charge and pull all the tapes together and figure out stuff. And lo and behold, as I'm down there, Jerry Hall gets busted for weed. They had to bail her out. And we were only supposed to be there for two weeks doing vocals and a couple of Jeff Beck things. We ended up being down for two months because Jerry had wow. to, go, Jerry had to right. go to court. And it was, you know, and so we ended up, um, you know, doing vocals. Well, first of all, I had to get all the tapes in order and make, you know, B reels and get all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. Manu Cache was a drummer, the original drummer. Mick didn't want those drums on there anymore. So Simon Phillips came down. Wow. Simon Phillips came down. We redid all of the drums on all of the songs. It was nuts. And there was no click track. S Simon. Holy oh, shit. Simon came <laughs> An in. Analog. Yeah, analog. So I would, and we're, and we're, it was like 24 track. Right. And so I would make a safety, but I remember having to bounce all the drums down to one track to open them up. And then Simon would listen to it and he would go out and play to the track, just the instruments, no drums. And he would just like get the takes. He would just like wow. listen to it and go, bam. It was amazing. Kind of fantastic. The, um, listen to his drumming on there. It's on Primitive Cool, especially one song called Throw Away. Wow. It ended up doing a bunch, you know, a bunch of Jeff Beck solos and parts decided to do the bass over so doug wimbish later to be with living color and mm. at that time which i think he was with tackhead uh doing a bunch of new york new york stuff kind of hip-hop stuff doug and uh, that's when i met doug down there for two months you know start work at two o'clock end at four pretty much you know go up to go to the beach in the morning have dinner relax i mean for god's sakes you know Francine's entire family came down and stayed. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <You know? laughs> We'd work for three hours a day. It was it was wow. great. Yeah, it was it was fantastic. Great time. Hey, what what was the uh, Jeff Beck vibe like recording him? Really cool. Really easy like, to work with. Yeah. Nope. I was I was really nervous because I do get nervous. I think I might have mentioned that when I meet somebody of stature or somebody that I'm a fan of, I might I get sweaty palms. Right. You know, I'll never forget working with the uh, Jimmy Einer. Uh, way back when, like in 73 or 74, and on that Langevin console, the console, it was wet. It was wet by the faders from my hands sweating so much. <laughs> I was so nervous. Anyway, um, Beck was wonderful to work with. He was a great guy. I beat him in Trivia Pursuit. Nice. I kicked his ass. It was great. Nice. Did, did he bring amps? or? Mm, I don't remember. I don't think right. so. I think he just brought his guitars. Right. A couple, okay, was maybe he like one picky? guitar. No. Was he picky about the sound no. or he just. No, he, he just did his thing. He plugged in, got, took the rat, got his. Rat pedal. Rat pedal. That was his right. thing. Had a strat. Right. And uh, there was probably some amps there, I think. Probably was a Marshall of some sort or an orange. Mm -hmm. So it was fun. We was down there, you know, then, you know, put Doug on and then Simon did all the vocals. And then it was, we were down there for two months and then it was time to leave. Go to right track Boom. and mix. Boom. 
Boom. And we were there for another month or so, you know, working with Keith Diamond, working with Dave Stewart would come in. And then we, we tracked some more stuff, um, Party Doll and one other song, I think. And they were rehearsing. Mick was going to do a tour with these guys. It's Simon on drums, G.E. Smith on guitar, Jeff Beck on guitar, Doug Wimbish on bass. And when they were rehearsing, we just stopped mixing for like a week. And yeah. they were just rehearsing. And it was, I mic'd it all up and recorded it. Uh, I recorded it to F1. I have an F1 of the like day, yeah. days of rehearsal. Wow. And they broke into stuff like free, the Jeff Beck song, Freeway Jam. Just, right. It was great. It was a good wow. time. And I would... I would run out there and play occasionally, you know, mostly drums because I could bang the drums a little bit. I could, right. I, I wouldn't want to play guitar in the same room with Jeff Beck or G.E. Right. G. Smith for that matter. Yeah. But what about playing drums in the same room as Simon Phillips? That's got to be. Simon, was, it was probably before he came in. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> no, because he's a legendary. I, I just know from all my album credits when I was a kid. Amazing, was amazing. So many great records. Yeah. Amazing drummer and a great guy. Yeah. Super, super guy. Is he English? I think so, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He brought his own microphones. He brought Shep's, Shep's wow. microphones. And he brought them and wanted me to use them. Yeah. yeah. Brought his own mics. It was ama amazing to me that he would not even listen to like the drums on the, on the playback. Just came up with right. his own thing and played to a rhythm track of the guitars, keyboards, and vocals. Right. In the right. bass, in the bass that was existing, it was. And w was uh, Mick? Uh, was he picky mixing? Was he involved? Oh yeah, yeah. We were. He yeah. was there all the time for mixing. Went to right track, started mixing. But we were doing overdubs as well, you know. And and then I'm, you know, other people. Bowie came in for like a day and hang out, you know, and meeting all these great people. Um, boom, boom, boom. Uh, a lot and, of fun. And who was hmm. the producer on it? Keith Diamond produced several tracks. Dave Stewart, Eurythmics. Stewart. Uh, did right. several tracks and then Mick did some tracks. Right. Yeah. It's, it's kind of an underrated record. It's not the greatest record. Um, it, it, certainly she, she's the boss of her, his first solo record. It right. takes, it takes a cake as far as, right. in my opinion, as far as, you know, solo records goes, but what an opportunity. Yeah. And, and during this time, somehow Mick gets wind of a rock band called living color who are playing Ooh. at CBGB's. Wow. And I didn't go to the gig, but one evening, um, Mick and Jeff Beck went down to CBGB's to see Living Color. They started talking. Mick fell in love with the band. And while we were mixing in Studio A at Right Track, um, Ron St. Germain was friends with Vernon. And uh, Ronnie and Mick did two songs, which ended up on the first Living Color record, Which Way to America and, and uh, uh, Glamour Boys. Those were the two songs. And, you know, the guys were hanging out. We were going back and forth to the studios. I had started using samples back then to, to tuck in behind, you know, uh, snare drums and kick drums. And uh, I remember that, you know, Ron, I think Ronnie, somebody wanted to borrow my sample. So he, I actually made a sample reel for Mick to go on the Steel Wheels tour. Wow. Yeah, that they used. Yeah. When I saw them live, wow. I knew there was, I, it was Charlie Watts playing the snare, but it was my sample. I heard it. It was Is awesome. It, and it was Simon Phillips' snare drum. <laughs> oh, my God. So it's actually a sample of a real snare, not like a Lynn snare mixed no. with something else. No, there were samples that gotcha. I, I, I made. A, I had a sample reel, which I still you, still have somewhere. And half, it's analog, right? It's analog. It's on half inch. Yeah. Unbelievable. And That's would, so great. I would sample into the a, an AMS machine. You know, so get it funny. in there. And then I record that onto another track and, you know, keep it behind the, the real mm -hmm. snare. So, so that's how you met Living Color. I met them and we were, you know, hanging out a little bit, you know, shared some meals in the studio, you know, when, when we used to have, remember we, remember we had food budgets? Yeah. yeah right. Wasn't that nice? We had food budgets. You had, you know, you, had, you know, Thai food coming in. So, you know, I'm, I'm walking out of uh, Right Track in a bright summer afternoon, I guess it was. And who, who I bump into right outside the door is Vernon. Hey, what's going on? How you doing? Hey, we got a record deal. Oh, Epic signed us. Fantastic. Hey, we're talking to producers and they're talking to like, you know, Phil Ramone, Gary Katz, all these, you know, fucking heavyweights. And then he says, and your name came up. He says, we should get together and talk. And I'm there. Okay. That'd be great. I'd love to, you know, work with, because, you know, I heard, I saw the, I saw the band live. I, you know, attended their demo sessions, hanging out with them. They're great guys, great musicians. Uh, really cool songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I say, okay, this is a, I remember it being a Tuesday and we figured out on Thursday, we were going to, uh, he was going to come up to the Upper West Side to 78th Street. I was going to cook him up some fish on the grill. 
because nice. I had that on the back patio. I had the, you know, the four by four and I had a little hibachi out there. Nice. Like a grill. I'm, I'm a nice. grill guy. I've nice. always had a grill. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I have my, my little hibachi. I'm the four by four out there. <laughs> so uh, the Thursday afternoon, I go to uh, Fairway and pick up the food for that evening's feast. And um, I come back and there's this little park there. It's, it's kind of famous for uh, homeless people and people selling stuff. And there was this uh, older gentleman and he was sitting on the sidewalk and he was selling his shit. He looked really down and out and he had a stack of records there. I always stop for records. Anyway, I'm looking through the records and I see this, this record. The first record I really recorded was going to be called The Skull Snaps uh, out of Newark, New Jersey. R&B, funk as hell. And um, the one song on the record has been sampled over 500 times on hip hop records. Wow. Um, we might have talked about it. So I'm looking through the records and what pops up, but the skull snaps. Awesome. Promo copy. Includes, Amazing. Includes the hit, I'm Your Pimp. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And I had never seen it. That is fantastic. Amazing, right? I'm stoked. I'm I'm fucking stoked, man. This is a record that, you know, I did. This is 1980. I think it's 87. And, you know, I did that record in 73. Never had a copy of it. They gave, they gave me a nice credit inside. I, I go, I, I didn't even go to, I went straight to the apartment. And I'm like, Francine, you're never going to believe this. Look what I found. Blah, blah, blah. I tell her the whole story. Cool. So I just, I put it in a stack of records, seven o'clock comes around. Here comes Vernon. We start talking, you know, before dinner. We're talking, chatting, playing him some stuff, doing this. I had done the, uh, we, you, we talked about World Shut Your Mouth in part one, I believe. Yep. And he really yep. loved World Shut Your Mouth. Oh, we, talk, we were talking yeah. about uh, that record. And um, I said, oh, you're not going to believe this, what I found today. And I, I get the record and I show it to him. And Vernon goes like, you did the Skull Snaps? <laughs> I learned Amazing. how to play guitar listening to that record. Oh my God, that's incredible. Right? Talk about synchronicity. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, here I am. I'm the low guy on the totem pole uh, uh, as far as the c producers they've been considering. And uh, this, I think that clinched a deal to Amazing. do the record, the friendship, the bond, you know, it was right. just this, this synchron synchronistic vibe that happened he just like gave me a big hug and said i can't believe you did this i can't believe you just went on about it all night and we enjoyed our dinner and like two days later they said we want you to do the record that's right uh, boom and that was boom that was my entrance we did it in new york we did it at uh, rehearsed at some place in the bronx um by a train that would come by all the time i mean it was right by the, the l uh, and uh, i remember that it was something and it was all circumstance. You know, my whole career has been fortunate circumstance. Yeah. I'll say it again, a little bit of talent and a lot of luck. Just, you know, knowing a couple people here and there and, you know, being at the right place at the right time. If it wasn't for Dave Jordan, if it wasn't for Tony Bon Jovi, specifically those two guys, who knows? You know, I'd be fucking be a greeter at Walmart or something. I don't yeah, know. but you got to be. Some, you got to be really good to be lucky like that, you know, because if you get the gig and then you, you kind of stiff it, so you're obviously, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? So yeah. it's not like, you know, it's great to get lucky, but you also got to make it happen. And you did. I mean, those records are fantastic. Well, thank, thank you. Thanks a lot. And people have to want to be in the room with you. That's musical, that's technical, and that's personal. And all of those things are, um, I think, kind of equally balanced in... The work that we do. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. You know, I like to, I'm not strict. I, I like to have fun. I like to, you know, as we all know, we're kind of a member of the band when we're working on a project. Yeah. We become part of the family. Right. And uh, the Living Color family is certainly a, a legacy that I'm proud to still be in, you know, Amazing. still have with the guys. Right. Uh, fr friendship wise and, uh, you know, professionally wise. I've mixed a couple things in their last couple of records. That being said, you know, that was pretty lucky to go to Barbados with Mick for two months. You think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was. He was lucky she got arrested. Yeah, yeah. yeah she got fucking arrested, and she got hey. off. You know why she got off? She got off because they wrote her name with a G instead of a J. Jerry Hall. It was addressed to Jerry Hall. G E R R Y Hall. Wow. Now she lives with Rupert Murdoch. Oh my God! I know. 
That's right. wild. Wild name. Yeah, wild. yeah, you know. Anyway, Living Color, we um where do we track it? It was a studio that Nile Rogers used all the time in Manhattan. Skyline. Skyline, thank you. Wow, good thank for Thank you, you, Stuart. Stuart. Good for you. Uh, I also did the Soul Asylum record there. Uh, tracked oh, it. Oh, awesome. Uh, hang, mm. hang Time with Lenny K. Um, we tracked it at um, Skyline. And, uh, oh, my God, well, several times in my, my life, this has happened to me. A real tension motor has gone crazy to me. And the tape is flying all over the place because I did a lot of tape editing. So, um, so I remember editing. It also happened with Julian Cope. And... Um, and, and the Cope thing, it was on a, it was a Atari machine, 24 track. And it just went, I was editing and it went just all of a sudden it went ape shit. But it was a Julian Cope thing. The tape went flying up in the air and snapped the tape. Mm. And it was, uh, mm. we're working on a, uh, um, a B reel and uh, it, it snapped the tape. And I swear to God, it was like eight inches before the beginning of the song. And the Simpty still, you know, I, I put it back together. It was kind of stretched and fucked up, but I put it back together. And um, when we and I was really afraid that once we put it, it together with the master and synced them up, it wasn't going to lock. But it did. It locked, right. and it was it was fine. It was on uh, on a song called Space Hopper. That's on that uh, Julian wow. record. Anyway, I remember at Skyline, the same thing happened to me. I'm editing one of the songs, and I, I was married at the time to Francine, and I grabbed the reels like this. And the indentation in the reel grabbed my wedding ring and Ooh. slammed it into this piece of muscle right here. I still have a oh scar. It's just like the wedding ring just went right into it and blood was pouring all over. It was, it was, oh it, was, it, wow. it, was it was unbelievable. I'm telling you, it was tough stuff, <laughs> tough stuff. Yeah. And then, um, so we tracked it all at Skyline. Then we did the uh, overdubs at Sound on Sound. Oh, well, yeah. Wasn't that a, was that on forty fifth at that point? Somewhere, yeah. Before, uh, yeah. what's the owner's name? Dave. Uh, David Amlin. Amlin. Dave, Dave Amlin. Yeah, um, you know he took over Right Track at some point, and now has a right, has right. a has a place in Jersey, I think. Montclair. Right. Yeah, yeah, Montclair. Yeah. yeah. Um, we did uh, all all the overdubs there, and we mixed it we mixed it at Right Track again. Now, right Track was pretty much my home base for right. for the years I was living in New York. Yeah. Hey, Stuart, Skyline is now Reservoir. Correct. Oh. Okay, gotcha. The studio, it's still in business. The yeah. studio, wow, yeah. yeah, right on. Actually, pretty yeah. nice. Yeah, and uh, I, the, I use the uh, the hallway part of the uh, drum sound on uh, Vivid is you know, effects, some some verb, this and that, but a lot of it is the hallway. It's skyline. I put a mic way down the fucking down the fucking hallway. The old mm. Roy Thomas Baker trick of you know getting ambient sound in there that I think we discussed in part one. Yeah, and um, yeah. it really you know that really adds a lot to that. Uh, the boom sound, especially on cult, on oh, cult, nice. cult of personality. I think I call it the room of doom. The doom room is called the track. So it was the 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 hallway or the stair stairwell. Stairwell. The stairwell was a stairwell was a power station. Right. Yeah, there was a but, hall. But there was a sta- there's, it was a, there's a stairwell at um, at Skyline. Skyline. Yeah, it, but I don't know if that's. It might. It might have been. It might have very well been. The record plant had a nice stairwell, as I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All those buildings had the the, yeah, the, the fire, early the fire escapes. Live stairwells. Yeah, yeah. Man. Yeah. yeah, 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 man. So the late eighties, you were in New York, right? You were still in New York. Yeah. And, and is that where you met the Smithereens in New York? Yeah, yeah. Um, Mark Freed, who was working for BMI at the time, uh, yep. inter- inter- thought I should work with the band, and it was before they did Green Thoughts, and we well we went to Mama Leone's for a dinner. Wow, and I met nice. the guy. Met the guys, and they had already, <laughs> <laughs> they already had, um, you know, they, they were all re- ready to do Green Thoughts, and Don Dixon was already in, in line for that. But they said, "Yeah, man, maybe you know, some at some point we'll get together, and um, you know, do a record." And I think it was '89 that uh, we finally decided to uh, work together, and uh, that's when we did uh, Smithereens Eleven. And you did that in New York. Um, we rehearsed in New York. We rehearsed at SIR in New York. We recorded the backing tracks at um, American Recorders. It was Rich, Richie Podler and um, Bill Cooper. They, they, were, they were a team and just had a blast of a time. And then we did all the overdubs at Rumbo. I think that was the first time I started working at Rumbo. 
Wow. They had tried it in there. It was the 80 series, I believe. And at this time, Paul Hammingson was working with me as uh, my engineer assistant, you know. So you, you took someone with you wherever you went? You took an assistant? I stole Paul Hammingson from Right Track. Paul Hammingson was a, um, an assistant at Right Track, and uh, it was suggested to me that I, you know, would could hire somebody to, like, you know, to help me out. And uh, hired Paul. He would do the setup. I was still hands-on. I remember, you know, sitting back as a producer. And I think, actually, I think the first gig we ever did together was a Living Color record. And uh, we were doing overdubs. And when I wanted some, when I wanted him to punch in, it would take like so long to explain where I wanted to drop in, where right. I wanted to punch in, that I, I, I just, I said, yeah, no, I'll, I'll just, I'll just do it. So he um, he would always do the setup and get get all the sounds going, run all the mic lines, take notes on outboard gear, et cetera, et cetera, uh, on takes that I said, you know, that's a good take, blah, blah, blah. I thought it was going to be, I'd be sitting back and people would be punching in for me, but that never happened ever. Right. So, um, you know, I, I couldn't get away from it. You know, just, it, I just, my brain works like that. It works so fast. Yeah, and then I, I mixed Smithereens 11, uh, Richard Landis, he had an SSL in his house. He had a little mix room in his house called the Gray Room. And that was the first. I, I mixed several records up there. And then he moved, uh, later on, he moved to uh, a studio called One on One in North Hollywood. So, like, during those years, I'm just looking at your discography. So, 89, Smithereens, Living Color, Jeff Healy, Motorhead. All those were within two years, right? Yeah, so would you call those your head banging years? Uh, I would call those my uh, yeah my peak years, kind of you know. <laughs> and it's hard. Jeff Healy is not necessarily a head banger. No, but he was He's pretty a shredder. burnt. He was we were, pretty burnt, right? Shredder, right? He's a yeah. super shredder event. Super, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what a great guy! I miss him. Yeah, He's, tell us about him. He was a Canadian. Yeah, guy, right? Yeah. yeah, and Paul was Paul was with me on that gig. Um, I guess we went up in, uh, I think we went up to, we went to the studio more in Heights. Uh, we rehearsed in Toronto. Paul came with me. Jeff was just an amazing talent. Great player. Plays on his fucking lap. Yeah. You know, it's, we recorded that and mixed it in 30 days. Wow. It was on a big schedule. It was the middle of winter. It was a, it was, it was great. Working with Jeff was fantastic. Funny as fuck. Do we talk about the, uh, Editing drums saving my life. Do we ever talk? Do we have we touched on that yet? I don't no. think so. I think oh, I remember that. This, this is a good story. You'll, you'll remember it now. Okay, <laughs> so um, it was right after the Living Color thing. I think it was it was like 1988. So we're we're going back a little bit, and I get contacted by Virgin Records um, to uh, meet with a band called the the Muscle Shoal. Young kids. They kind of they sound like kind of sound like Squeeze. The record never came out. One of those, and we all have a couple of those in our pockets, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, I flew to London, met with the band, went to a rehearsal. You know, we just talked about what we're going to do. We decided to do three songs. Paul came with me. We went to London. It was December of 88. And we went to Rockfield, Rockfield Studios. We set up and tracked. And then the next day, we were there for th only there for three days. And uh, the second day, we um, tracked one song and it came, it was great it came out great and uh, kingsley comes in the owner and says oh let's all go out to dinner we're going to monmouth i'll treat you guys it's good to see you ed come on let's go um so we go out to dinner and the drummer gets shit face drunk i mean he literally walked off the curb when we we're getting going back in the van and fell in the gutter and we have two more tracks to do the next day and it's our last day at rockfield you know, he was he had that serious hangover, couldn't play for shit. So he cut two songs. It took all day. We were, we were going to move studios. We were going to go to uh, Rupert Hines' uh, studio called Comfort's Place. It was about an hour and a half away somewhere. I don't remember where it was. So I just did take after take or with a click track. The, 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 the tunes were at the same tempo. So... When we get to Comfort's Place, there's only one tape machine, you know, most, and, and it was a fucking 3M with that loop and editing on yeah. that thing. And so I have three reels of tape with two different songs, and I spent the entire day editing the drums. 
You know, it, it just it took forever. Day and a half it took. And uh, it knocked us back. So we finished up, you know, we were scheduled. We had a car waiting. We're packed, we're ready to go. Car's waiting outside, it's eight o'clock. We're working, we're doing overdubs, we're not finishing. I'm, I wanna do rough mixes. Ain't gonna happen. Eight o'clock, we have to leave by eight o'clock to get to Heathrow on time. It was like, actually, it was, I think it was more like a two hour drive. We had to leave by seven. Yeah. And um, it didn't make it, and Paul's, Paul is pacing. It's his daughter, Natalie's first birthday the next day. Wanted mm. to, there was a party planned, he wanted to get back for the party. And I'm like, oh shit, Paul, Paulie, we're not gonna make it. So we just, he's pissed off. We keep working. I guess it was around midnight or one in the morning. I get a phone call from my then wife, Francine. On the phone, she's like hysterical. She says, oh, you're there. Oh, thank God. And she's crying hysterically. I'm there like, what the fuck? What's going on? And she said, David, our friend, mutual friend David Renson called her. And he said, wasn't Ed supposed to come back uh, uh, t today from London? And, and uh, she says, yeah. And he's there. Well, the plane crashed. Oh, God. Wow. It, oh, was, God. it was Pan Am 103, the Lockerbie. Wow. That, that, the bomb over Lockerbie. Yeah. Oh, God. So I think Sky TV was going on back then um, in, in the UK. And we turned on the news, and sure enough, they had it already on the news. Um, and uh, it was a shock. And I went and Holy shit. I went and found that drummer and fucking kissed him and hugged him. Oh, my God. Because if, if it wasn't for that drunk fucking drummer... <laughs> Right, you'd be wow. dead. I'd be dead, and so would Paul. Yeah, because yeah. we were supposed to be on that flight. Oh, my God. That's fucked up. That's, speaking of editing, um, so describe the process of editing drums. You were assembling a master take. Is that what you were doing? Yes. And how, how were you doing that on tape? Like, what was the process? I would take different sections from different takes. I would listen to the takes. I'd occasionally take notes. And then I would actually, I, have a, I had a great memory for remembering what parts were. And usually the studios had two tape machines. Right. So I could listen on, on both of them and I could take right. the section out and, then, you know, cut it out, let it roll onto the floor and replace it. Um, that, that particular on uh, the Muscle Shoal tape, I remember there being 38 edits. And I would use fills from one song and go into the other song. Because right. the fills were all fucked up, and I, right. you know, right. it, it was crazy. What, what a process! And yeah, then, it was, it was then, really tedious. Yeah, and then when you're mixing and you hit rewind and it goes, like it constantly, you're right. going through all the edits. Yeah, yeah. There was um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, John uh, uh, John Aguto, his name is Gitas, an assistant at A and M, was working on one of the Metallica records that Bob Rock was mixing at A and M. And he counted like 180 edits in the song. Oh, my God. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I talked about mixing at the Gray Room. The Gray Room, Richard moved his, all his gear to a, a studio called One on One in North Hollywood. I did three records in, I guess it was a period of six or seven months. And Metallica were in the other room at the One on One. It was the Black Album. And... When I w walked in there, they had been working on drums for quite some time. And when I finished those three records, complete, mixed, done, mastered, put out, Metallica were still working on the drums. They, they, had, a core. <laughs> they had a solid chorus. <laughs> <laughs> there was a stack of um, drum heads in the room that had to be uh, six, six and a half feet high. They must have Amazing. spent a year doing drums on that record. Yeah. Well, it paid off, obviously. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's like a. So that would, it's got to make you a little crazy. I mean, it's just, you know. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Randy Staub yeah. was the engineer on that, I remember. Right. Um, but that, all that editing, and it was the same record that uh, Gitas counted the 180 edits on one song. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are producers and engineers who border on. Obsessiveness. Possibly, yeah, obsessiveness. Yeah. And, and we've all been proven that that can actually work to great effect, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, but but there are probably 
more examples of it not working to great effect? For me, it didn't work. I, I spent three months on the follow-up to Smithereens 11. You know, I spent right. three, we spent three months on it, and I was obsessing on that fucker. I think the guys were kind of getting a little uptight with me about that. Right. Uh, right. Taking so long with the drums and getting it right and working with a click track and, you know, and they're a great guys, great band. But, you know, we spent three months doing that and, you know, it's so like, you know, five copies. Right. Uh, after, well, after, Dennis is a great drummer. Though. Oh, yeah, he is. Absolutely. He's but, a fantastic drummer. They're, yeah. they're all good. Jim's great. They're playing mm -hmm. now. I'm going to see him in a couple of weeks. They're playing at the oh, cool. at the coach house out here with Marshall. You know, um, sitting oh, Marshall's in. sitting in. Oh, yeah, great. Marshall and uh, Robin from Gin Blossoms does dates as well. Wow. wow. So we finished the Jeff Healy record and, you know, recorded and mixed in a month. Uh, there, there was a funny thing. We went, um, my friend Sass Jordan and a friend of hers came up to do some backing vocals. We did two days of backing vocals, or one, yeah, two days. And then we went out to some club somewhere. And um, the drummer, Tom Steven, uh, we, we all got pretty tipsy. There was some band playing. Jeff sat in with the band um, at this big, big club. It had a hotel. It was like a hotel and a club. So, you know, if people were hooking up. They could get a room. It was kind of wacky. And um, Tom got really rowdy, and they called the cops on him. And he, wow, yeah, and he, uh, they, they're fighting with him in the snow. We're all witnessing this shit, and one of the cops grabs his hair, and it pulls his fucking hair, and it's a fucking wig, and pulls his fucking <laughs> pulls his fucking wig off off his head. It was great. That's amazing. Yeah, so that was a uh, kind of retribution for all the shit that he was giving me. <laughs> <laughs> and right after that is when we started the uh, Living Color Times Up. I literally um, worked until 4 in the morning, packed my bags, got on a, like a 7 a.m. flight, um, got into New York, dropped my bags off at the apartment on West 78th Street, and got a, a car to go out to what was called Iwi. Um, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, Iwi. Is that, that's where your place is, right? Yeah, Stewie's there. Yeah, yeah, Stewie's there. As well, we speak. We, they, there's a stage there, and that's where we rehearsed right. for uh, Living Color Time's Up. Ah. Yeah, rehearsed for two weeks, and then we... Um, we went out to, I wanted to cut it. I love the uh, A room at A and M, and that's where I was doing a lot of work. So you know, eh, stay home, work at A and M. The guys came out. We did a little bit more rehearsal in L A as well, and then we went into A and M Studio A and we tracked it there. And a lot of it was live. We did a lot of that off the floor. Um, right. Uh, love rears its ugly head. That's all. Except even the solo was live. Uh -huh. you know, that's a, that was pretty much off the floor. Wow. Overdub the vocals, of course. And that room sounds amazing. I found some rough mixes recently and, and shared it with the guys, and it just sounds, sounds bitching. So good. It's amazing. Yeah, that room sounds just amazing. Neve, you know, the Neve console in there. It's so interesting how, like, your early career, I mean, they're rock records, they're pop records, they're soul records, but these kind of heavier bands were attracted to they wanted to work with you and and but you weren't doing you know like uh black sabbath records in the 70s no and so was it do you think that they were it was ramon's influence that I, you know i really don't know i don't analyze things right i just kind of right. take 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 it as it comes it's a huge decision for a band right but i think it's sure. a guitar thing might you know, be uh, might be a guitar thing. I don't know. I think Ed's like known for his like just ripping guitar tone. You know right. what I mean? Like all those records have great guitar tones. So if a lot of people, whether it's a Jeff Healy record or a Motorhead record or you know um, the Smithereen, I, I think band when people hear that. It's like wow, those you know they if you play if you have a band with the guitars, I mean it's pretty powerful. You know so. Was your guitar set up back then like super intricate or was no, it just like no, one mic? No, I just put up a. An 87 and a 57 and go. I let the guitar players pretty much choose, get their right. tone. I never right. fucked with Johnny Ramone's tone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you right. know, or anybody, or, or Healy, or Vernon, you know. Yeah. Put up a fucking microphone and record right. it, you know. Um, do, you, uh, do you put them up particularly close to the uh, speaker or far away? And do you, use, you don't use room mics, right? I do. You do? I do. I, I um, you know... Sometimes I'll use really ambient mics, and sometimes, right. you know, I usually put, 
you know, a 57 or, you know, I, I actually have a, uh, uh, an old 555 Sure that was underwater for three days. Wow. That sounds like shit, but I, I use that a lot now. You know, right. right up right up close. There's no bottom end. There's no top end. It's like all... Rah! Oh, great. And it works great. Um, I have an RCA ribbon mic that I use like six feet away. Right. And, you know, throw something down the hall if uh, if I... But I don't really use all those down the hall much anymore. But I right. will I will use, you know, uh, a mic above, you know, at ear level above an amp about five or six feet away. Yeah. And, a, and a close mic. And I'll put them on separate tracks. Right. Um, I used to combine them. Like on the Ramon stuff, I used to use two two mics, but I would combine them onto one track. Yeah. And then double track it. But I am really want to be I am really precise about it. Right. So it you know, and I don't pan them well, I did pan them all the way out on Leave Home on the Ramones record, but you know, I bring them in a little bit. I like the I like the double track, so maybe there's something magical about that. You know, right. and you know, you after, you know, when re-listening to Beatles records, you hear all that shit that's double tracked, and right. the, especially the vocals on the early stuff, and a lot of the George's solos. A lot, a lot of influence there. From all these bands, do you would you say you've maintained relationships with a lot of these people? Like, yeah, most of them. Amazing. Yeah, pretty much so. Especially through Facebook, you know, people find me. Probably at least one person from every band I've worked with, um, and you know, on. Really, you know, phone call relationships with a lot of people as well. It, it's such a uh, a side effect. It's a it's the opposite of an occupational hazard. It's the it's a beautiful part of of having these intimate relationships with people. Yeah, it's a it's a family. You know, yeah. when, when you're working on a record, as we all know, you know, you become family. Yeah. yeah. Especially, you know, back in the day, you used to spend a month. Yeah. A couple months, eight weeks. Yeah, three months. Three months working on a record yeah. and your, yeah. your family. I used to get depressed after finishing a record because, you know, all the camaraderie is gone. And as I've mentioned dozens of times, you know, I miss the camaraderie. And, and it's it's also like, um, like the difference between, like, you're in there with a band, you're making a record. That band, as soon as that record's over, that their life is invested in that record. Sure. You're on to your next record and your next scene and your next yeah, man. friends. And and that's always kind of, uh, uh, to me, a very interesting part of the process is that the bands that we work with are, it's probably taken them years to get into that point where they're in the studio. Mm -hmm. Then they live that record for a couple of years. Yeah. And it's really such a huge part of their life. And uh, I, I don't know, when I go back and... And, and I don't do it very often when I listen to stuff I did way back. It, it's kind of like I enjoy the musical part of it, but I also, uh, the personal stuff really comes to the surface kind of right away. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, anyway, I just think that, uh, you know, being a producer, you know, you're entrusted with these people's lives. But, uh, and it's pretty much it, yeah. it's not just music. It's not just rock. I mean, it is rock and roll and it is just music. But it's a life, it's a it's a pretty heavy responsibility. Yeah, you're pretty impactful for that amount of time. Yeah. Right? I mean, you're, you know. But but it's a huge responsibility. Yeah. And, which is probably why, Ed, you were, you were cutting that tape on that drum thing for a day and a half. Because it wasn't just because you wanted to listen to a great drum take. It was something you were working towards. You were... Um, you were given the responsibility uh, when you go in the studio and you shake a band's hand that you're going to do the best thing you can for them. I yeah, I try to do the best that I can to my to my ability, and honestly, it's you know I'm a judge, I'm a jury, um, I'm a best friend, I'm a psychiatrist, um, a cook. Yeah, I thought you were going to say I'm psychotic. <laughs> I'm a, <laughs> you were gonna say. That too. I'm a psychotic. You know. So at, at this point, I mean, we all. The three of us have our own studios now, now that John's got his mix room. Um, at, at this point, when someone sends you stuff, do you go, uh, are you wishing you'd be out at Capitol or at some big studio, or are you totally good at home? I like it here. I like right. I like being here. I like being by myself. Yeah. Um, 
I miss the camaraderie. You know, I'm at home. I could work at my own pace. Um, you know, I'm not a youngster. I'm not 30 years old anymore. So it's nice to just pace myself and not work 12, 14 hours a day. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and you know, we all take for granted at this point, like the total recall ability of oh, yeah. walking. I mean, we all take it for granted. But remember those days when you had to be in a room we all kind of started pre-automation, but even with automation, the, the nightmare of recalling something... Always. I, uh, you know, was, fortunately, I had an assistant when we were, I was working in studios, Paul Hammingson, and uh, I remember doing recalls, and it would take three hours to set it up, and it never came back the same. Never. never. Ever. With all the outboard gear we were using. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'd be using shit tons. I was always mostly at A&M. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. working um, when it was A and M before Henson took it over. I loved, I loved the exercise of a being the console to the mix yeah. for a half hour and trying to figure out what was different. Yeah. It's like wait, the bass, the bass has a little bit more top end, and you tweak that. And it's like wait, there's something about the guitar, the voice is that a little more re-? you know what I mean? And you and, do and that also, forever. Yeah. And also, you're in commercial studios that other people are working in. Gear gets swapped in and out. Yeah. Things get regulated differently, and all of a sudden, machines, one little element. Yeah, yeah. W- w- the machines could be out of alignment slightly. Right. Yeah, you know, you never know. I think, did I mention this story when I was doing Joan Jett at Hit Factory? I did like three songs with Joan and Kenny um, at Hit Factory. Back in the 90s, it was uh, for a record called Pure and Simple. And um, we recorded at one of the big room at Hit Factory, Tommy Price on drums, and I forget who else was playing bass and guitar. I mean, Joan. You know, Joan, Joan I met Joan back, you know, in 78 uh, during the rock, when we were filming Rock and Roll High School. So I've known Joan for a long time. Finally got to work with her. And we were doing vocal overdubs at Hit Factory in a smaller room and uh, doing, uh, doing some uh, backing vocals with her on a, a song called Insecure. And when I, when I, I play it back... And it's like five dB down, and it didn't. It's like what the fuck's going on, you know? It's, you know, I'm going in it. You know, I, I was a hit at zero kind of guy. I never went over the over zero. I never really saturated tape. So, but it goes in at zero, and it's coming back at like minus five. I'm like what the fuck, guys? You know, they check the alignment. Same thing happens. I finally look at the tape box, and they were using a Joan Jet tape from 10 years previously. It was like, you know, I, I probably used, I, I don't know what kind of tape I was using at the time, 456, Grandmaster, I don't know what it was, but it was like, you know, on 250, um, you know, different bias, different whole different setup. Right. I'm like, yeah. guys, and we spent like three hours downtime trying to yeah. figure, they were trying to figure it out. I started on, on mixing, I started listening to the tape playback. Mm. Right. So you're listening off the repro head. Listening off the repro head. I always start, I started doing that probably in like 88, 89, somewhere around there. Listening off the repro head to make sure there were no dropouts or, mm-hmm. you know, it, it was coming back the same. You know, uh-huh. A being it. Yeah, because I, I, I don't remember. Yeah, I remember. Um, actually, it was a, on a Ramones project at the studio. And when we went to master it, there was a big dropout in one of the songs and I had to take... It was in a chorus. I had to take a piece from a previous chorus and put it in. And, wow. you know, it, it worked just fine. I don't even I don't even know where the edit was. Who knows? But it was just a little bit. You know, I probably like you know, you know, put in like you know, eighteen inches of tape from the another, um, uh-huh. made a copy, made made a copy and put it in. So, but hey, John, when you were assisting like way back, w- w- were you responsible for aligning the machines? No, the maintenance guys did. Okay. Presto, Steve Barish. Right. All those guys. Yeah. yeah no, we, no, those guys came in at eight and did all the rooms. You know what I mean? They did each room for each session and then they leave. And, you know, we would actually print a mix and then play it back. But, you know, also we played it back because there were so many manual moves. Right. Everybody was doing moves. So you wanted to play it back to make sure everybody got their moves together. Yeah. Um, so we'd have to listen back to mixes. But um, back to the tape thing, me and Steve Wynn. Uh, from Dream Syndicate just reminisced about a session we did at Water Music where he bought secondhand tape and he bought like 10 reels of it or six <laughs> reels of it. Oh, shit. And, and we got drum sounds and listening on input and sounds great. And I was like, Linda, so his wife, 
then girlfriend drummer. Linda, play the song just without the rest of the band. Let's see how you come in and you'll listen to the drum sound. So on input, sounds great, some sounds great, sounds great. It comes in, I hit play on repro, and it's like, and we were like, oh, fuck. And I knew it was the tape because it was used. And, oh, God. Um, yeah, so uh, we had to basically buy tape and um, like get it that day because we, we, we lost like half a day in the studio just trying, and then a line. Uh, and then we um, we started fresh like at seven o'clock at night. Right, it was just a fucking nightmare. There were so many different elements that could be variable in terms of recalls, and um, but like Ed, I assume you're set up. You got your your speakers you like. You got all the toys that you need. Do you ever find that you go shit? I uh, uh, there's a piece of gear. I'm mixing something and I need something. I have a studio, an analog studio. Yeah. But, um, like, John uses a ton of analog gear when he mixes, even though it might be a Pro Tools mix. There's a ton of analog stuff going on. Um, do you have, like, everything that you need? I or don't, do you ever... I, I, don't yeah. use any, I don't use anything analog. I do everything in the box, you know, all the plugins, And um, I take the analog outputs of my uh, converter, and I take the outputs of... Pro Tools, I put it into a dangerous two bus and break it down that way. I, I assign um, d the different outputs. I use 16 outputs and uh, I use one and two for monitoring uh, and, and recording into the back into the box. And I'll take the uh, output of um, the uh, dangerous two bus stereo output and put it into inputs one and two. And I records right, I listen through that way and I record it right back into Pro Tools that way, but I don't have anything else in between. There's no compressors, um, you know. I don't put any compression on the on a, on any of the buses, um, or EQ. It's all everything is in the box. So as soon as I bring back a mix, it's exactly the same. Right. You know, the thing is, like the front end, we all like to. I mean, tracking is a different story. This sure, is, absolutely. So I mean, tracking, we love to go out and we love to be somewhere where you have all your your rich um, things that, you know, your mics, your trees yeah. and all that, your desks. Mm -hmm. But it, it's so interesting how the mixing part of it has really, the in-the-box thing has stepped up its game over the last... It sounds good, man. Yeah. You know, and I, I like Pro Tools. I like digital. I remember so many times... You know, listening to especially like the kick drum, it would always come back mushy. It wouldn't mm -hmm. come back on input. It sounded great, put the tape out, but it's like roof, roof, roof. I really love working in digital. I don't. I don't think I'll ever touch tape. I probably haven't touched tape in 20 years. Right. But I just love working in the box, and you know, especially when you're working on you no know, 16 songs, where you know I mix them, I send them, put them up on Dropbox. The guys listen to it. They take a couple notes, and then we have a Zoom session where, you know, they can listen in real time with audio movers. But, you know, it comes back exactly the same, exactly the same. Right. It, it just, it's so blessed. And, you know, I love comping vocals in Pro Tools. Right it's yeah. a miracle of modern recording, in, yeah. my, in my opinion. Thank you, science. Yeah, and I can work on, I'm, I can work on s simultaneous projects. Which I'm right. doing, you know, I'm doing a dictator's mix. I'm doing working on the long riders thing. Um, I'm work, helping Alan Arkish with this uh, his movie Get Crazy. I'm doing some incidental music for the extras on a, a Blu-ray release. I, I still I don't know about you guys, but I still when I punch on Pro Tools, I still anticipate my punch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I probably when do I, as well. Yeah, when I would think, when I work with younger people, they go, "Well, why are you always going in early?" It's uh -huh. like, Habits. Yeah, it's a habit, yeah. I, I do the same thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, definitely. I just also think so many of projects I've been working on over the years, you know, like there's a certain freedom. Like there was one band that, you know, they had eight songs, but they wanted to work out a couple in the studio, you know, and I was able to just turn on the session and let it go and you'd run out there when something was cool and tell, you know, it's like what you can't really do that with tape. I mean, you'd have to be like, you know, Bruce Springsteen with 200 reels of tape. Of course, darkness, of, you know course I mean? of course, of course, of course. But um, yeah. that doesn't work for everybody. 
And I, you know, and, and Ed, I, and, and Stu, I do agree about the comping. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, you can let the guy or girl warm up for five or six tracks and then get some good takes. Yeah. And I guess. And it's like fantastic. I, yeah. I take, I take everything, you know. From, yeah, me too. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so used to. Yeah. Uh, you know, Stuart's motto is take everything, give nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know what we haven't covered. There's probably stuff, you know. Um, do we talk about Motorhead at all? No. It's the, uh, the only band, uh, the only project that I actually quit. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah, and, uh, you know, wow. hey, hey, I love Motorhead, I love Lemmy, but um, he liked the Living Color record. And, um, but he came to my house in Sherman Oaks, and we you know, had a backyard with a pool and you know, a little area you can hang out in, so... We cracked a couple beers and hung out with Lemmy, and we started talking. And Lemmy was like, yeah, I saw the band Living Color live, and they were terrible. And if you made them sound good on that fucking record, Vivid, I want to work with you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and they were a great band live, you know, got, got to, but apparently yeah. Lemmy didn't think so. <laughs> so we uh, decided to work on, uh, three, uh, work on three songs. Uh, which were uh, included on the 1916 record. We set it up, we scheduled it. This is probably in 1991, 90, around there somewhere. We went to rehearse. I, I was rehearsing, do, I was doing pre-production in, for several days or, or weeks, you know, at that time. And uh, we did a pre-production and, you know, walk in and there's this big, like a glass-covered table in the, in the uh, rehearsal room. And I walk in, the guys are all there. Lemmy's already, you know, have, have, has a drink and, you know, he's cutting lines of crystal meth. And he... Hey, as you would do. As, as, want to start? Want to start, mate? And I'll pass. So I passed on it. And, you know, I knew about these issues. So we rehearsed. And then we went to uh, American recorders again to do the tracking. I was doing a lot of tracking either there. American or A&M was my place to track. And, um, you know, we were there for a few days. No, we were there for a, a good week, maybe 10 days, actually. We did everything there. We did overdubs. We did everything there. And, um, you know, Lemmy would come in, love Lemmy, love Motorhead. And uh, there was, they had these big, tall, plastic uh, glasses. And he would fill it with ice and fill it up to like an inch of the top with Jack Daniels and then pour in a little bit of Coca-Cola. And be smoking cigarettes and and drinking at like eleven a.m. So, but he acted normal, pretty much. You know, right. he, he wasn't. He didn't. You know, he was Lemmy. He, he could handle that shit. He's been doing it for decades. And the funniest thing about I, at that time, I went. Uh, I got interested in um, police radio. I got a scanner at Radio Shack, and, <laughs> and I brought it into uh, the studio. And you know, uh, I should. Uh, let me say, what's that? What, what are you doing there? And I said, told him, it's a police scanner. I and mean, you listen to all the police bands and you can hear what's going on. And he fucking loved that thing. There was an outside area and Lemmy would, would strip down to his, uh, the, one of those little bathing suits that uh, the French people wear. So he strips down and he's out the, and I'm looking for Lemmy. I look outside and he's there standing with the police radio, his drink on a stool and he's smoking cigarettes, listening to the police radio. And looking up at the, getting his suntan, he's sunning himself. It was. I wish I had a camera. Wow. It was. Um, <laughs> so okay, we finish everything, uh, and I'm ready to mix. So I, we go to one on one in North Hollywood. Metallica's probably still doing drums. <laughs> <laughs> Today, <they're> probably still <laughs> yeah, probably. And um, so I start mixing the song. There was this one song called "Going to Brazil," and as I always do. I uh, I threw on like a tambourine and uh, maybe like a clave or something, duck, duck, like a kind of a Latin America kind of feel thing. And uh, I had we had done another song the day before, and about three o'clock in the afternoon, Lemmy comes in, and he was really tipsy. He he wasn't right, and he's there. What the fuck? And I went to the Went to the rainbow last night and played this tape and I can't and I can't hear the fucking bass. Where's the fucking bass? And he starts moving all the faders, mm. you know, all of them. Like where? Where's the bass? Where's the bass? Where's it? Like fucking up the whole mix. 
And he comes across my tambourine and clave. He goes, what the fuck is this? Who put these on there? What is that? What's that? What's that? And he leans, he leans on the back of my chair. And it tips over. And I hit my head and I get knocked out for wow. a second. Oh, fuck. I, I get knocked. I, I'm seeing stars. And um, that was the end of it. I, wow. uh, I saw stars. I got my bag. I packed up my shit and just walked out. Wow. Was he yelling at you as you left or he didn't say anything? He was, he was like, what's a fucking base? Jeez. Wow. And then a couple years later, um, uh, at a Ramon show at the Ritz in New York City. Mm-hmm. And after the show, Lemmy was there. I'm talking to Joey, and, Joe, and Lemmy comes over, and Joey's like, hey, Lemmy, this is my friend Eddie, Ed Stasium. And, he's there, and Lemmy's like, oh, nice to meet you, man. <laughs> <laughs> so did the record ever get finished? Did somebody yeah. else finish it? Yeah, Howard Benson finished it. Oh, okay. They finished those tracks. They mixed them. They might have redone something. I don't know. I have rough mixes that sound really good. Did they take the percussion off? Yeah, they didn't use the percussion. Uh. And Levy told stories that he fired me because of it. Uh, but um, in his mind, he fired me. But in my mind, I left. Right. I, I quit. Right. <laughs> He's, um, God, I can only imagine with people like that. Although I've had a couple in my life who are real wild cards. But yeah, I can, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's what it is, but it was. It's a good I'm not, move. you know, I'm not against the physical abuse when I'm making a record for somebody. It's, you know, sometimes you got to go through it, you know. To get to the other side. Fighting. Yeah, a little yeah. fighting. Yeah. A little. Uh, I, th there was this band. I don't know if you remember them called Ed Gein's Car. Yeah, you turned me on to them. Right, they were from. They played at CB's at sh all the time. They were a big hardcore band at CB's, and this is like 1985, and they were great guys. But they would get fucked up, right? And one night, the guy, Scott, is out there doing a vocal. You know, he takes his shirt off, and he's, you know, all inked up, and he's doing his thing. And I turn around, and the guitar player's got a, a pistol right at his fucking head, right? And so everyone in the control room just hits the floor, right? Wow. The song, the song stops, and Scott, the singer, goes... Tim, if you ever fucking do that again, I'll kill you. And that's how the album ends. We actually got it on tape. Oh, my gosh. But, but we went, and then everyone, like, very, and the guy had a loaded gun. No shit. And he was fucking drunk out of his mind. Wow. And it, that was, like, it's one thing to, you know, to make a record, and but, but it can it can go... Just like Lemmy knocking you on the head. You could have, he could have totally done some damage. So, Ed, I think, I think we're great, and we can't thank you enough, you know, Tony, yeah, buddy. Well, th James, th thank John, you. myself. Thank you. We're really yeah. honored to have you. Um, this was a pretty comprehensive, and it's a pretty amazing journey. 49 years, and, uh, and just keep going, and brother. And just keep going. All right there, gentlemen. Yes, fellas. Ed, we love you. We love you Ed, too, buddy. Okay. Love you guys. Ed, love thank you, you so much. Love Beautiful. you all. Thank See you. you. See you, kids. Bye. Me and Stewie want to thank all you gear clubbers for listening to this crazy podcast we do. If you can, leave a review on iTunes. It really makes a difference. And don't be shy. We love hearing from you guys on the social media, at Gear Club Podcast. Don't forget to go to gearclubpodcast.com for Spotify playlists, links and photos for the episodes, and my favorite hot sauce of the month.